welcome back to the Speak Up Erica podcast. I'm back with Rosemary and Kendra. Um, and welcome back, you two. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. I, I think our last time that we recorded together was last October, was mm-hmm. it? Yeah, I think so. Already like yeah. six months ago. So yes. yeah, it's it's so nice to be back together again and um, talking about our next topic, which is uh, art as a healer. Um, but before we get started, I would love to ask both of you to introduce yourselves again. Um, Kendra, if you would like to, sh- to start and share. Sure. Um, my name is Kendra. I'm an editor slash writer. Uh, right now I'm doing my PhD at the University of Ottawa and I edit for Rosemary Davison's uh, Girl on Harlow Street. That's awesome. about it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Kendra. And, and yourself, Rosemary? Yeah, so my name is Rosemary, and I am the author of this serial novel called The Girl on Harlow Street, which is running on Patreon. But beyond that, I've just started a YouTube channel called The Mind of the Writer about the psychology of writing. So that's in its very early stages. And also um, engaging in the daily poetry on LinkedIn. So those are sort of my three projects at the moment. Um, And before that, in my pre writing life. Um, I taught as Spanish in my own business to adults and business people for uh, 25 years. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for sharing. Um, it's really awesome that all the projects that you're doing, it, it's very inspiring. And I know Kendra and I were also chatting about that in the last episode too. Yeah. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Before we get started into our actual topic. I do have a fun question to ask both of you, um, kind of relating a little bit to art. So my fun question is, if you were a crayon, what color would you be? And <laughs> Kendra, do you want to go first? You go first. I know you have an answer. <laughs> I do have an answer. Um, burgundy. Oh. Uh, or at least some rich red, you know, wine, plum, red scarlet color uh, because it's my favorite color and uh, I believe it it's representative of you know sort of deep creativity Hmm. so it would be burgundy I love that that's a great answer I feel like most people choose their favorite colors I think (laughs) I was thinking like uh, either a black or like a neutral so that I could use it as like both filling in lines and then maybe creating my own lines Ooh, I think outside the box yeah Yeah, that's good (laughs) that's a really good one (laughs) thank you maybe yellow for me yeah maybe maybe something a bit bright (laughs) I don't really growing up my favorite color was pink but I don't know if I have the same attachment to it anymore Mm -hmm. and if I would want to be a pink crayon now (laughs) I think my favorite color is based on something in my childhood. I can remember being quite young and holding up, uh, it's, just, it's such a strange memory, but holding up a, a red, almost plexiglass type toy. It was a, a brick or a block or something like that and holding it up to the sunlight and having the sun shine through it. And that sort of translucent, deep red color was mesmerizing to me as a child and so that's where this love of burgundy and wine and that deep red color uh, comes from. So before we get started into our discussion tonight I do want to make a disclaimer that we'll be sharing our experiences experiences of how art is a healer for us but that doesn't replace um, any support that you may need from a professional and that we are not doctors or psychologists. So this is not a replacement for medical advice. Um, But we do use art as, I guess you can say, kind of a coping mechanism or a way for us to release um, any any experiences that we we may be having. So just a a little disclaimer. um, And I will ask my first question. So since 
since we all are kind of artists in some way, um, how does art help you release your emotions? Um, maybe Rosemary, would you like to start when probably, I guess, when you write or when you're creating any type of art? I think that art is a, is a great uh, vehicle for catharsis, any kind of art. But because my particular art or my chosen art is writing, for me, it's, I would say with releasing the emotions, if I'm stressed in my real life, if I'm stressed about something, if I'm trying to deal with something uh, in my real life and there's a lot of emotion there, for me, I can flood that emotion into my characters and that's really safe. And if I have built up emotion, you know, that I haven't released over the years, which is the case, then I can really flood that into the characters. So they're doing really crazy things on paper that I would never do in real life or that I would never do off page anyway. But I can really tap into the layers of those emotions that I haven't maybe expressed in my lifetime and then just really rev them up and and put them into into my characters so I would say that's one way that art is a release of emotion uh, for me and then the other way is with the poetry that I'm you know doing daily now and sharing which is done in real time that's a little bit different. Um, I'm in a more meditative state when that happens. And, and when I'm doing that, I'm definitely releasing emotion, but it's a lot more organic. It really is just sort of like flowing from me into my phone, <laughs> into LinkedIn, uh, to who, whoever's reading it. And that for me is, a, is, is actually really, really helpful. So there's flooding the emotion into the characters that's also done organically, but it's a little bit more structured um, with the with the poetry, which is free of any plot. It's free of a novel, and it's done in a semi meditative state. I'm still freeing myself of emotion, but it's just done in a lot more, let's say, zen like way. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, both literature and all different kinds of art can be either like escapist or also kind of like a way to recognize everything that's going on and kind of like have a fresh perspective on everything from an external point of view. You can kind of take yourself out of the moment and kind of look at it from an objective perspective. Um, even uh, one of my favorite poets recently said, you know, even if we write something that's not escapist per se, like we can write something quite dark and um, heavy, but it's it's not getting to that dark place. That's the catharsis. It's coming back from it and it's coming out of that dark place that we're able to finally feel this relief that we won't have otherwise. I completely agree. And I think that there's this real duality and I'm still trying to figure this out myself, uh, Kendra and Erica, but where you are escaping, escaping, but you're also reconnecting with things in yourself. It really is this, oh, I'm, it's like a contradictory, kind of a contradictory thing. So for me, um, I can escape the specifics of my domestic life and let's say, enter and escape into this other world in the girl on Harlow Street. But at the same time, so I'm escaping the, the sort of the specific scaffolding and I'm going into another completely different, you know, it's a made up story, but the emotion I'm carrying with me. So I'm carrying the emotion from my real life into the fictional world and I'm able to cope with my emotion and deal with that emotion in a safer storybook world. In other words, the storybook world to me seems like a very safe place to deal with that emotion. So I'm still connecting to myself in some way, 
but I think it's an emotional, it's an emotional thing, but it's the, I'm escaping from the sort of my story per se, as you would see it on a piece of paper, but I'm carrying the emotion with me. Yeah. That it's it's interesting because I haven't wrote fiction before, um, only nonfiction, uh, I guess real life, yeah, real life stories. So it's awesome to see that the way that you're able to escape in your stories in that way. Because I think when I was writing my own personal stories, it was kind of hard to escape really because you had to revisit those traumatic moments and write about it but at the same time writing about those uh experiences also was an escape because you're kind of letting it go and go on paper and releasing it out there um yeah well this actually is really interesting because now you've said that I'm wondering when I write a fictional scene somewhere as I'm tapping in to that emotion or or into that resource of emotion for the fictional scene somewhere at the back of my mind almost like the well that I'm drawing from do I still see the real situation that's feeding the emotion that I need for the fictional one I don't necessarily know the answer to that but it's just because because I still feel the same emotion you know so when Erica when you're saying okay well you're writing these real life experiences and you're revisiting them and you feel really emotional when I'm writing a fictional scene which I I haven't actually lived not not in terms of the structure of it Mm -hmm. I feel intensely yeah as intensely if not more so than in the real situations because in the real situations whatever they are I've probably had to keep quite calm I've had to be um very level-headed and so when I write the fictional scene I am very in touch with the emotions and and you know and and if if someone were to come in when I when I'm writing depends what I'm writing but you know I mean I I cry when when I write and I can feel panicked when I write and yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing, Rosemary. I never thought about it in that perspective. So it's mm-hmm. really awesome. And- I've heard actors say the same thing, you know, that they find something in their own life to, let's say, provoke or stimulate the tears and stimulate the sadness for whatever uh, dramatic scene that, that they're in. So this is really interesting to me. Does that mean that when we're creating, we're kind of split between reality and fiction because we're, we're aware that of, of our, of our own lives, of, of what's happened. Mm -hmm. You know, you are kind of drawing from somewhere. It is coming from a, a place, whether it's in the same emotional capacity, or if it's coming from something similar that happened, you're kind of drawing from the same emotional place, right? Rosemary? Yeah, I think so. And I think that that's what makes fiction real Mm -hmm. for the reader. And we could probably say the same thing for all the other forms of art too, because, Mm -hmm. and Kendra, you know, you know this more than I do, because I'm not, I'm not a dancer, but if a dancer, I would imagine, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or right, but if a, if a dancer is really in the moment and they're really feeling um, their movements and and what they're doing and of course it's combined with the music as well usually the audience is going to feel that energy really intensely Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is that the case with dance oh absolutely there's no faking um especially if you're putting on a performance like emotionally um the audience can tell that it's not coming from a true place, but even at the very baseline of like the movement itself, if you're not truly like dropping your arm or if you're like just kind of like acting out as if you were doing it, like the audience can definitely tell. So that's why you have to like fully commit, even if it feels like you're going to fall over. Um, Otherwise it just looks like you're faking it. And like, what's the point? I think that's, what puts artists in a internally in a vulnerable place maybe externally too because in order to 
tap into those truths and to be to be authentic in what you're doing you really do have to go to these difficult places mm -hmm. in in yourself and um that's a very vulnerable thing to do even if you're not exposing the exact details of your life mm -hmm. you um well i mean it's just it, it just is a very vulnerable thing to do yeah i'm wondering rosemary do you have anything that you do after you write or any kind of art um when you're in that kind of creator mode and then you go to a place that's maybe too emotionally heavy positive or negative or anything in between um do you have to do something to like bring yourself out of that mode like any like calming down practices that you have well for me i do that on with regards to my writing and with regards to everything mm -hmm. so these are like my confessions in a way <laughs> um when i'm not writing like when I'm not in that creative mode and there's been periods of my life when I haven't been, I can watch very heavy uh, TV dramas, you know, British crime, my favorite. And I, I can do that. I can, I don't take violence very well, but, but I can watch those heavy shows. But when I'm going through a difficult time in my life and, and, or, um, when I'm writing the way that I had to write in The Girl on Harlow Street, or didn't have to write, but the way I was writing, when I'm not in that mode, um, oh my goodness, here come the, here come the uh, confessions. I watch what would be considered to be very, I don't want to put down anybody's uh, creativity when it comes to TV shows, but very lighthearted, frivolous reality TV. Um, nothing that requires me. I, I don't like to even put it this way because it it's it, to me it's coming across as a little bit judgmental. Um, but I stay away from television shows that make me think too hard. And mm -hmm. I also am quite uh, frivolous you know, lighthearted, like I, I craft a lot and, um, you know, cook and, and just, just, Feel good. Re yeah, just really lighthearted sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if people were to see me doing this, you know, making up baskets and, you know, making party favors and things like that, they probably would think that, that I'm, I am a frivolous person, but there's nothing actually Frivolity for me is anything but. Um, frivolity for me is a celebration of beautiful things. It's a celebration of uh, just really enchanting things in in life. And if that comes in the form of uh, ribbons and, <laughs> and craft sort of stuff, that's fine. Um, and even with the, the reality TV shows, it's the same thing. But for me, that, that's how I break from the heavy handed, uh, things in my own life and the heavy handed things in the, in, in my writing, you know, I can't then consume a lot of hard hitting television, uh, mm -hmm. as well. You mm -hmm. know, I need to, I need to take a break. What about, what about you two? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any like routine per se, but I do also have to kind of um, weigh where I'm going to place my emotional energy and it's not always going to be in like the entertainment part. Um, so I love a sitcom just so it's formulaic. I know nothing crazy is going to happen, um, but it's that pattern is soothing and it still gives you that kind of relief that you need after getting very emotionally invested in a piece of work mm -hmm. and also i don't want to watch anything that's going to trigger me mm -hmm. or that's going to trigger very difficult uh, mm -hmm. emotions so if i'm watching um some sort of uh dating show let's say yeah. um in the caribbean or wherever uh, chances are i'm not going to be triggered mm -hmm. you know while person a is trying to choose between person <laughs> b c and d and Again, 
maybe that seems shallow, but I don't think it is. And I'm also no. um, really interested in human nature. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm watching that type of television show, um, I can't help it. I think as a writer, or I mean, maybe it's the same in other forms of art too, but I'm always studying human behavior. I'm fascinated by human behavior. And even if that behavior is curated for TV, it doesn't matter. I'm still interested in curated, curated behavior or, um, yeah, I just, it fascinates me. So in some ways I'm still, I'm still researching in a way. And yeah. with my, the way my mind works, I'm always, it doesn't matter what I'm doing or watching. I could find a color. I could find, um, I don't know, physical features that I'm going to be popping into a novel or a poem or, or whatever. It's like, it's no matter what I'm consuming, it's like my mind has little hooks. <laughs> it's just picking stuff up all the time that could work its way into a poem or work its way into, or work its way into a plot. So it's downtime, but it's also not downtime because I'm always absorbing. Mm -hmm. How about yeah. you, Erica? Yeah, I love how we're talking about this because I feel like I feel that a lot of people actually do this when they watch quote unquote like trash reality TV <laughs> and try to escape through that way from their own what they're dealing with. Um, for myself, I I don't think I have uh, something that I do afterwards. Same as you, Kendra. I don't really have like a type of process plus I haven't written in a really long time so I guess I express myself in an art form through different ways now whether it's through creating events and I feel like that's the way I I share my creativity now or um doing like the podcast I was I feel that creating all the podcast episodes that I've done is very therapeutic and I don't know if you both have felt that way too from our last episode of kind of a release and an escape, I guess, but definitely the trash TV. I it, it's it's so like what you said, Rosemary. You don't really have to think about anything. You can kind of just enjoy the drama of other people because it's not happening to you, and it's it's quite nice. <laughs> I I love I love a good trash TV. <laughs> well, what I was gonna say too is um, somebody. Uh, wrote to me um, on LinkedIn, I believe, or at least on some form of social media and asked me, um, you know, you're t I think the, 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 the message was you're turning out a lot of work. And so when do you take a break? And when I look at my life, the writing is my break. It's, it's, so that is my downtime. That is, that is the time when that is my spare time. It's what I love to do most. And so, and it's what I would choose to do probably, you know, um, so that, that is, and I think that ties in with what you're saying, Erica, it's like when you're doing, when your work is creative, then it, it really isn't like work. It's, it's the, it's the fun, mm -hmm. you know, I was about to say, how lucky is it that we get to do things that people will do for work in our free time and um, the vice versa, like we, we can do both work and play at the same time when people have to kind of compartmentalize those things. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think for me, it's maybe a little bit different. Well, I don't want to say it's a little bit different than for you because I can't, I can't pass judgment, but for me, because I haven't made any money on the girl on Harlow Street. And, and for me, it's, it's like, I don't want to call it an investment in a, you know, an entrepreneurial endeavor, but in many ways it, it has that feel to it because I've started something and I have, you know, hired people and I've paid people and that money has come from, you know, my work, from savings, from all over the place in order to fund this project. So I, and I don't use the, the word sacrifice is out of my vocabulary now because anything that I've done in my life is, is a choice. Um, and I've chosen to do this 
because it's it's my dream but it's almost like it's my dream the same way that maybe a startup company would be for for someone else so i've chosen this and i'm really thrilled that i've chosen this and i was thinking about this today because there's such a debate on how artists must be paid and this is something that i've adopted for everyone else you know so i've paid everybody you know their asking price because i want to teach people that you know especially young professionals who are getting into these artistic fields that you know you have to know what you're worth my position as the person doing the hiring and the person investing in the person is a little bit different because i I'm not making money at this point. I'm I'm investing in a dream. And with the with the poetry it's the same thing. You know, I'm doing that just because. I'm I'm not doing it because I want necessarily any money out of it. I'm just doing it just because because it's good for me. It's good for whoever wants to read it and I think the flip side of creating art is that if if you're a singer you just want to sing at at some point if you're a painter you just want to paint like for me it, i'd say that's almost not a choice for me it's like breathing i have to breathe i have to write i have to do it because it's part of who i am um and i think that that one day hopefully the girl on harlow street will will bring in in money you know that that's the plan long term but right now i well you know yeah i i'm just doing it because i because i love it and because i want to yeah because i well i just because i want to and because i have to um have to don't have to do it uh i have to do it for my soul I could totally relate to what you're saying because I remember when you asked me about Locals Fest and if uh, it was kind of like my baby similar to how the girl on Harlow Street is your baby and it, it kind of is because we're not making oh I'm not making any money doing Locals Festival and I, I do love supporting locals and just creating events so it, it's funny because like you do it because you're just so passionate about it and you just um, even if you're not making anything, you're just having so much fun doing it. And it's a lot of, um, well, from what I've heard is that if you're so passionate about something that eventually it will start making you money. So it, the girl on Harlow Street will make money. <laughs> I'm putting it out there in the universe. <laughs> so um, another question I, that I did want to ask was, how does art and creativity um, kind of help you release your bur burdens and how does it help you heal as an artist? I don't know if Kendra or Rosemary, either of you want to share? Do you want to take it away, Rosemary? Okay. So, oh my goodness, the answer to this question, it's so multifaceted because the creation of art helps me in so many ways. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about this topic because I believe that it has the, it has the power to help everyone you know not just not just me or or you know any creator any consumer um or any audience so with me personally as i said before um when it comes to characters it, and this is in the novel more than in the poetry i can release a lot of layers of emotion that maybe wouldn't be appropriate or healthy or healthy for me to you know release around the house in my off-page life and and I can flood those into the characters but um for me right now um in my life I mean this this process that I'm doing right now on, on LinkedIn is is huge in helping me and the way that that started or at least it seeds um, are in January when I had COVID. So I'm immune compromised and COVID hit me dangerously hard. And so I was in bed for the best part of five weeks. 
and all the strategies that I had to cope in my life, those strategies being writing at the computer um, in, in my workspace, walking, um, therapy, I do regular therapy, various support groups, um, creative, I mean, a creative entrepreneur, a group, and cooking and all the things that I do to, to cope were gone um, because I couldn't sit at my computer. So therefore I couldn't participate in any of the groups. I couldn't walk past, I mean, I couldn't walk down the stairs for a while. Um, and I, I had nothing. And once all my coping mechanisms went and I was sick, my mental uh, health began to deteriorate quite rapidly because healthy people and people who are fighting for their mental health, you, you've got these coping mechanisms and strategies in place to, to help you. And once those are stripped away, then then that can be very dangerous. So all I had was my phone because I couldn't get out of bed. So on my phone, I started to post little stories, like little anecdotes from my past. And I called them long story short. So I put a photo up from, you know, the archives in my phone. And then I talk about the event and then I'd say long story short and I'd give a one-liner and I found that these things were getting more response than anything I'd ever put up about the girl on Harlow Street and very slowly this process which didn't require me to get out of bed it didn't require me to talk um, became a, a little lifeline for me and this is where I think social media can be very helpful because for me, it was the difference between really descending into mental distress. I was in mental distress because I was so ill. And after COVID, once it was over, even though I was better from a COVID perspective, I still have not been able to like walk for an hour and a half or two hours. And for some reason, it, it really debilitated me mentally on top of a relatively stressful, uh, stressful past and a stressful life. So one morning I was just sitting there and I thought I just went through my phone and picked a, a, a picture of a tree, which was very beautiful. And I put the tree out there. And I think it was a two line post. I mean, it was just two sentences. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I think it got maybe 50, 50 responses as opposed to two or three. And people seem to resonate with this tree. And so then a couple of days later, I, I sort of did it again and I put another you know, picture up from my telephone. It didn't require a lot of work and, you know, dipped into my thoughts and put those out there to cope with my own stress. So in some ways I was writing whatever I was writing, I'm writing it for myself. So even with the, the, the tree, it was something like, you know, in the grayness, remember the gold, like, don't forget that, you know, there's gold out there. That was just a little note to self. Um, and then I realized that my note to self was something that maybe other people would like to hear as well. And then it became a, a daily thing. And then the poems became longer. And then it's like, okay, now I think I'll put a video up. I'll go in my phone and I'll find a video. And then you run out of videos and then it's like, okay, now I have to go out. I actually have to go out in the world and I have to start finding more photographs or more images. And I have to start finding more um, things that I can film, more beautiful things. And I have to find enough things that I can do this every day for a week and then I'll have to go out. And so all of a sudden what you have there is the most healing process you could imagine. It's sort of almost 
um, I'm not in too sentimental mood at the moment. Like I'm not going to cry. But if you think about that, I'm in pain. And so I am helping myself by writing a poem to myself, essentially. And then I'm sharing it. And then I'm getting these wonderful, wonderful responses, which are so therapeutic on top of people sending me pictures of sunsets and, you know, they, they send me photographs and things. And, and then, and then that leads me into the physical world, into the natural world. And so you've got this cycle, you know, art, the physical world, the audience, the audience reciprocates. Then I go back to write and then I go, it, it's like a circle. And for me, this is the healing power of, of art. But not all art comes from pain, obviously. But in this particular case, I'm suffering with something. I need to find a way of helping myself in the way that I would help myself, <laughs> which is fairly gentle. You know, I'm, I'm not the type of person you're going to see running over hot coals, um, waving my arms around, with, and, and that, that's not my, my style. I think for me, I need a more gentle form of, of healing, um, especially if your life has been dramatic or if you've got, you know, you, for me, I just want a very peaceful way of healing. And this just seems like a great way to heal. So that's my example of you know, how, how does art heal me and how does it, you know, and, and, and I learn, you know, I was never particularly a, a foresty or forest seeking person before this, but as I stand and I start to seek it out, all of a sudden, like the lessons are right there. You know, I'm looking at some willow trees, the horizon is behind them but they're at the edge of the water. So it's also in front of them and they're drinking from the horizon to feed them. And then I look at that and I think, okay, that's a really good message for me because our dreams or things that we think are in the distance aren't necessarily in the distance. They don't have to be, we can have them. And our dreams are the very thing that feed us. So, that for me is such a healing message that that I that nature's giving me and then I'll, then I feel you know I've learned something and then I share it on on social media and so yeah art is very very healing it's finding people who also resonate with you like I feel like the more someone else resonates with my work the more I resonate with it back because now I have this like deeper connection with it beyond just what I had with my own thoughts. I had kind Absolutely. of like a, a sounding board to hear it. And it's really, isn't it like, it's kind of like shocking or like surprising when someone comes back and goes, Oh my God, I really loved this of yours. Or I really loved like hearing someone else go through this or like oh I totally resonate with this um it just gives it so much more meaning than just keeping it to yourself maybe even though it does take that much more courage to put it out in the world you're um again another quote that I love from one of my favorite writers um she said usually a piece of work is good if you're embarrassed if you're embarrassed it's usually good um because it's vulnerable and you're putting yourself out there and like sometimes that's scary or embarrassing or like puts you in a weird situation but then when someone really resonates with it it makes those stakes even higher and the rewards are that much better well I mean I've read quite a not quite a bit of your work but I've read enough of it to know you know that you're very body focused on your on your work which makes complete sense because mm -hmm. of the dancing background and when I read your work it's the discomforts with certain things that you write about physically that resonate with me but 
for me to relate to it, you have to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. to write it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even to see yourself as a reader in the position of the writer too, and say, oh yeah, like that's totally how I experience it too. Maybe I hadn't even like thought of it in that way until someone had put it out there. And now I do see that resonance. Yeah, absolutely. And Erica, what about you? Because, you you know, you wrote a nonfiction book about your experiences. So did you find that that was cathartic and healing for you? And how did people respond to that? And did their feedback help you? Yeah, (laughs) great question. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, Before I released the book, Um, I was so anxious and even though it did feel healing to write it 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 intensified the emotions that I was having and I don't know if it kind of felt like it was making things worse in a way because I'm like oh my gosh people are gonna actually read this and I'm sure both of you have probably felt that way too like people are gonna hear or I guess read what they're what I'm thinking kind of thing or the things that I've experienced and that's definitely scary to be vulnerable to people Um, so I was terrified (laughs) Um, and it was um, surprising I guess you could say because when I released it and people were actually reading it the responses I got um, made me emotional because uh, they were able to relate to it and they the feedback was just uh, something that I didn't expect so it was healing and a lot of emotions definitely involved but going back to what both of you were sharing I think it's art and a sense of community combined that really like puts that healing process in a in such a different place um and like connecting with people about the art that you've created and it, it's so special I think yeah the and it's like the reader and the writer like that connection is just so special the thing about this the connection between for me I think in terms of reader and writer but we could say if we for the any creator or artist in the audience that's there for me that's the missing piece of the healing part so if you take the creation of art and again this can be dance or music or film or whatever so the creation process itself has a lot of healing properties it's for many many reasons and I don't know how long you want the podcast to be but you know I've got all my reasons listed off but the once you work into that other factor that what what's been cathartic to you and all the ways that that piece of art is is healing for you is then passed on to someone else so that they can benefit from that and they can disconnect for a little while from their domestic reality at the same time as processing things that they've been through in their life through your art you are then passing your world to them so that they can do the same thing and then they give you that energy back in terms of their feedback which then motivates you to create more or like even in your case Erica you didn't write another book but you created your podcast and you started with locals festival so one artistic thing healing artistic thing became the foundation for more and you know you started to interview more people and that's that's sort of how how i i feel right now and and kendra do you feel the the same yeah absolutely i feel like even editing or even just reading uh, someone else's work too does that kind of creative process for me and finding community because then I can even tap into someone else's voice and become the reader or become the audience member in in the place of being the creator themselves and bring my own memories and bring my own interpretations into it bring my own perspective even if I don't have a way to like exactly connect with what they're saying um, you can always find some sort of like 
touching point with them. And that kind of connection itself is creative, I think. I'm thinking, I agree. And I'm thinking of two points, which, which I previously written down for this podcast, two healing points of art. And one is that it allows you to transcend whatever circumstances you're in. Like for me in COVID, you know, I could, I was very confined and and I could transcend that confinement, confinement through the activity on, or at least through these little stories on, on social media. But at the same time, if if you were with art, you you were never you were never alone. You're, you're never alone if you have a good book or you have a good you know you have a good um, you have a good movie. You're with those characters. So I was thinking today something that I I wanted to say is that if you read beyond your time period. So if you're reading authors from other centuries, you have centuries worth of invisible friends in the characters, right? You, you don't just have one or two invisible friends, you've got them from past centuries. Mm-hmm. But are characters like invisible friends? Are they, because my argument would be, and this is the, the, the fiction writer in me, is that characters are not invisible friends. They're not just simply figments of the imagination. It's not sort of some um, delusional experience that these characters can be your friends because the characters contain all the emotional energy, the wisdom, the life experience of, of, of the authors who, who created them, who, who wrote them, or maybe who received them, maybe they didn't, and, and, and they just sort of flowed the way I do. They flowed all of their wisdom, like I say, I'm not wise, but they flowed all of their, their emotions and their feelings into those characters. So those characters, while they are characters and they're fictional, they are vehicles of real human emotion and mm-hmm. real human life lessons. So when they are with you, you're not just with sort of invisible, you know, make believe people. You are with, you're with imaginary people that are real, mm-hmm. and you you are never alone. And I think that that's one of the healing properties of of art. If you're on the consumer end of it, and in that, this relationship between the reader and writer is completely transcendent in terms of time and space because something could be written in the 1800s and somebody could be reading it. Let's say it was written in England in the 1800s and somebody's reading it in Canada now, like now, they they have a bond, an energetic bond with the author that has nothing to do with distance. It has nothing to do with time periods. And because I, you know, have an, I mean, I'm sure everyone has an imagination, but there's nothing I love more than to imagine a writer before electricity writing with a quill, uh, writing by candlelight, and then imagining, you know, two or 300 years later, somebody turning on their computer and reading it on a computer screen and still feeling the same emotion that the author felt when they were writing it by candlelight. And to me, that's just such a beautiful, it's just a beautiful image. And this sounds really over top of romantic, but it's just a beautiful thing. And I I think I'm going to make a video about it, or I'm going to have videographer Matthew do a video about this because it's just this, I think about a star you know, like the nearest star is four light years away. But, you know, so when we see that starlight, it's um, it's four years old for the nearest star. In most cases, it's, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of light years away and, and, and more. And yet for us, that's our present moment. But what we have in the present moment is something that is, is quite old, but it is very real. And I think of the same, I think that the, that the story or the the literature is is like the same thing. You know, it left that author, you know, a few hundred years ago, 
but it's in your present now and it's real and it's real in the present to you. Mm -hmm. And those two things, so the transcendence and the never being alone aspects of, of art, very, very healing. Oh, did you have something to say, Kendra? I just feel like maybe that's, um, maybe that's a testament to how real your characters are. Like, I feel like, um, it would be too easy for you to simply just like write a story and have your characters be either too easily your friend or like too distinctly decidable. Um, you don't have to like kind of parse through their personality. Um, you know, your characters are very well developed, so they're very complex and they're going to have very dynamic responses and not everything's going to be as easy or straightforward as like an imaginary friend would per se, you know? Um, you have these like complex shifting relationships with different power dynamics instead of just like someone who's very agreeable or someone who's always alongside you no matter what. Even if these characters do follow you, they still have this kind of like more complicated relationship that um, it's very telling of your writing process and actually fleshing them out to make them a whole person. And maybe that makes them feel more real than just like an imaginary friend, as it were. Well, we're dipping a little bit into the girl on Harlow Street. Am I allowed to do that, Erica? That's totally okay with this. Yeah. <laughs> because it's also something that I'm trying to work out on the YouTube channel, The Mind of the Writer, in terms of how characters come to me. So I won't go into the into the sort of intricacies of it. But with the characters, for me, it's really interesting because Again, one of my guilty pleasures, as you were asking how I relax, is I love to watch, you know, psychic mediums at work. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, people think they're legitimate or, or not. I just love the process. And I think the reason I love the process is because even though I'm not a psychic medium, um, when you see them at work, it's very similar to how the characters come to me. And if I'm in the right state, if I'm in that zone, they they show up and they have their own uh, needs and complexities and wants. And sure, I'm giving them my emotion. I, I understand that, but it really is like I'm channeling them, like I'm I'm recording them. And where the difficulty comes is when they want to do things that maybe morally I am a little uncomfortable with writing or you know, they, they want to behave in a certain way that I, that makes me nervous because it's like, it makes me nervous because, oh my goodness, I'm about to write this. Really? You, and so that is probably Kendra, why you say, okay, well, they're really complex. They, they're not doing things that I would have them do if I were completely in control. I, and it's so weird because in this mind of the writer thing, I'm dealing with the fiction writer is sort of puppeteer the, per, the person in control the the captain steering the ship but also in opposition to that the story is the is in control the, the ocean being the story dictating what the captain does and I feel that huh this is veering away from healing but I think the reason why you felt that in the characters is because those characters, who knows where they come from, but they don't entirely come just from me. So. And I guess that's maybe a way of uh, releasing your burdens or even personifying them. Like there is definitely a scientific evidence that's shown if you personify or uh, give uh something a name um you can kind of talk to it and kind of reason with it like whether it's your anxiety or um a nagging intrusive thought you can give it like a name and kind of characterize it to 
be able to kind of control it in the way that you would, I guess, characters would control you or you would hope to control characters, but you'd have this kind of relationship otherwise that you wouldn't have. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And like, sometimes it's not always healing. It is kind of a balance between giving and getting from art. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You can be disturbed by, by what you write. And I think that um, in the catharsis, one of the things I had written down, how art is, is healing, it's cathartic, but it's also a, a, a safe place for you to realize or to act out these intrusive thoughts that you wouldn't necessarily act out in your off page life. So when you have intrusive thoughts and you have all of that coming into your head, instead of just letting it fester in your in your brain and and become become worse if you channel those intrusive thoughts into things on paper um or you know plot twists and and things like that you you get rid of them so it is a, a cathartic a cathartic experience it's somewhere for you to put I think D.H. Lawrence said that you know authors get their sickness out on paper um and I always I, I didn't really like that expression when I was younger but now that I'm you know a little older I, I completely understand what what he what he meant I love that idea about personifying um, the characters too. I've heard that before and some people call their anxiety Sam or like their anger. They call it like uh, maybe, I was going to say potato, but that's not a name. <laughs> but they they just give like names to their emotions. So it's, it's really interesting how it ties in together. Well, yeah. another thing that, that, and we talked about this in the last podcast, but with cruelty. So, you know, and I think anyone who, who knows me in, you know, in my, I call it, I'm now saying my on-page life and my off-page life, but my, my off-page life that, that I, I'm quite kind. Like, this is a big thing for me, like to just be very kind to people and to, to live my life with a very kind heart. But that doesn't mean that I never have cruel cruelty or I never have cruel thoughts or that I, you know, that other, if, I mean, I'm, I'm human. But in my work, in the novel, not in the poetry, because that's a completely different thing, but in, in the novel, there are instances of, of really harsh psychological cruelty um cruelty in things that people say and cruelty in things people do and those things in the novel are very twisted and when again when I write them it's like where on earth did that come from I mean because that's not necessarily me yeah but what it allows me to do is to get cruelty out of myself mm -hmm. even though I don't I'm not cruel but if there's any traces of cruelty in me they will come out in 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 the writing and that's a really good place for for that cruelty mm -hmm. to come out because it's coming out into a plot where cruelty for for the plot for the story for the um anticipation for the suspense because remember, it's a murder mystery. So <laughs> cruelty is completely necessary in that story. So what mm. I'm doing is I'm pulling it out from myself and putting it into the story. And then, you know, Rosemary, me in my in my real life, I'm, I'm not, I'm not cruel. No, you're not. <laughs> and sometimes so. it can be surprising. Like, sometimes you can be like, where did that even come from? Like, how would I have thought of that? But um it manifests in different ways, eh? 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, as, as, as you know, it's the same with, with all the sexually explicit material in the book as well. Like, I, I mean, this is a book that is uncensored. It's very explicit. It's, um, you know, and, and I, I know some people that know me who've, who've read it are like, I can't, I can't wrap my mind around it. I just can't figure like, it's like two different people. Like, you know, how, how is that possible? But again, I think it's a really healing thing. It just allows you to express, um, express in a way that maybe wouldn't fit with the, uh, or, or it would lead to a very toxic, unhealthy life in, mm -hmm. in reality. So thank you everyone for listening to part one of Art as a Healer uh, with Kendra and Rosemary, and we'll see you in part two.